But in case you're wondering what I'm doing here, or you're perhaps already thinking, oh look, it's just another MP um, attempting to jump on the bandwagon, I thought I should start with a bit of an explanation. Um, you see, I've not always been mired in the world of politics, um, and in a previous life as a Tudor historian. Uh, before I was elected, oh, this sounds even worse than being a Conservative MP. Um, <laughs> Before I was uh, elected in uh, 2010, I agreed to write a book on, on Bosworth, not just the, uh, the battle, but how the Tudors rose from humble beginnings to claim the English throne. And I began my research by attending a conference held at um, Leicester Council offices. Some of you, I imagine, were there, where another archaeological discovery was uncovered for the first time, including some 30 cannon shots dug out from the Leicestershire mud. And, of course, the Bosworth bore discovered in fields two miles away from the presumed battlefield site at Ambien Hill, putting to rest the question that the battle was fought much nearer to Dadlington on the marshy plain known as Reedmore. The excitement then in the air as the late Richard Holmes chaired the conference was palpable and convinced me that I had to write a new history of Bosworth, telling the story not only of the battle, but of the epic struggle of the Tudors from the moment that Owen Tudor supposedly fell drunkenly into Catherine of Barwell's lap at a ball at court. Now, for, for nearly three years, I juggled my new life as an MP with uh, research and writing. My, uh, my travels took me to the archives at Nantes and uh, Vannes in Brittany, scouring receivers' accounts for evidence of Henry Tudor's period of exile. I undertook to recreate Henry's journey from landing at Mill Bay in Dale on the Milford Peninsula to his arrival at uh, Bosworth, to visit the deserted Tower of Elvin, hidden in a Breton forest where Henry had been imprisoned and from the sixth floor of the keep in the 1470s. The thing is that as my research progressed, I realised that the story of Bosworth could not be merely the rise of Henry Tudor alone. I needed to explore the downfall of Richard III and the reasons why, only after two years and two months on the throne, his reign and life ended in defeat. And so, like many of you here today, I'm sure, I travelled to Middleham, to Sheriff Hutton, to York Minster, following in the shadow of the last Plantagenet king. I joined the Richard III Society, and almost immediately found a dedicated team of historians willing to assist me with my research, including your president, Peter Hammond, his wife, Carolyn, Geoffrey Wheeler, and Leslie Boatwright, the late Leslie Boatwright, whose memory I've dedicated my book to. Then, just as I had about to finish the draft of the book last August, I suddenly received news of the possible discovery <laughs> of Richard's remains in the car park. I may have been one of the persons who wasn't too pleased. I, I rushed up to Leicester, where I found myself in an orderly queue stretching around the block as I patiently waited my turn to view the empty grave site of where the skeleton had been discovered. It was, I thought to myself, as if I was queuing up for 45 minutes for some rock concert, except that the, um, the rock star here had been dead for 527 years. Nevertheless, as I fought my way past onlookers videoing the empty grave pit on their iPhones for posterity, it reinforced in my own mind the undoubted facts that Richard III remains our most celebrated, if controversial, monarchs, as familiar to the everyday person as Henry VIII or Elizabeth I. Yet, if Henry VIII is commonly remembered for his six wives, or Elizabeth I for the eternal question, did she or didn't she? <laughs> the first question I ever get asked about Richard is, so, did he kill the princes? Or, was he as bad as everyone says he was? Yet I believe to answer the question directly is to fall into a familiar trap, very much as if I was to say to you, I'm a Conservative MP as opposed to a Labour MP. Almost immediately, you are forced to defend a position complete with all of the ideological baggage that goes with it. In the eyes of the questioner, you already belong to a camp, to a tribe from which there is no escape. You either think Richard is a good king or you think he's a bad one. Now, many of you here may be proud to be termed a Ricardian. I only wish that others took your passion so seriously. The politics of Richard III, you see, is not only unfortunate, I would go as far as to say that in the past it has been destructive and it has hindered the spread of academic scholarship into the king's life. Historians, you see, are not always um, political beasts. I know many who have been warned off studying Richard, concerned that to do so might damage their reputation. Now, that's not to say there have been many excellent historians of Richard III, for example, Charles Ross, Rosemary Horrocks, Tony Pollard, Michael Hicks, to name a few. In addition, the Ricardian was transformed under the stewardship of Anne Sutton to become a fantastic minefield 
of information into the king's life and times. Yet I find it bewildering that this superb journal of the society, containing first-rate articles, can only be ordered from the stocks of the British Library in this country. Equally, I find it concerning that the Richard III Society, an organisation of which I have nothing but the utmost admiration and respect, should be considered somehow odd. <laughs> I speak, as I said, as a member of the society myself, who, coming to study Richard, had to quickly put aside the preconceptions that I'd been told. And when I quickly discovered the society's dedication to the principles of historical scholarship and rigour, without you, it is likely that many texts, such as the Crowland Chronicle, or the York Wills would remain unedited. And without you, Richard's body would certainly have remained undisturbed underneath that car park. Now, we're all familiar with the black legend of Richard III, woven after Richard's death. As a politician, even I wince at the audacious U-turns performed by John Roos, who, when Richard was still alive, had praised the king as being a mighty prince and an especial good lord who through his love of the common people got great thanks and love of all his subjects, great and poor. Only to later change his mind, reporting after 1485 that Richard was excessively cruel, who had died like the Antichrist to come, confounded at his greatest moment of pride. It was perhaps all too convenient to speak ill of the dead while attempting to curry favour with the new Tudor regime. Nor was Roos the only other commentator to change their tune. The Italian Peter Carmiano, who'd come to England in 1480, wrote lovingly of Richard the year before Bosworth that if we look first for all religious devotion, which of our princes shows a more genuine piety? If for justice, who can we reckon above him throughout the world? If we look for truth of soul, for wisdom, for loftiness of mind, united with modesty, who stands before our King Richard? What emperor or prince can be compared with him in good works or munificence? Two years later, with Henry Tudor on the throne, Carmiano had suddenly reversed his opinion, turning his pen against the murderous tyrant. Yet, if we are to use the methods of historical scholarship to remove the layers of myth, rumour, and untruth about exactly who the real Richard III was, so we too must be wary not to be seduced by the temptations of Halstead, Markham, and Josephine Tay and to fall victim to the romanticism of creating, in effect, a white legend of our own. The Richard III Society was founded in 1924 on the single principle of discovering the truth of Richard III. Yet we all know at some times the truth can be uncomfortable. Nevertheless, the historical truth of Richard III can only be pursued if we are willing to leave aside ideological fervour and emotion and remain resolutely dispassionate, determined to focus on what the evidence tells us. This means that we cannot selectively quote from history, which for convenience sake fits the portrait one wishes to paint. To do so is to be no better than the Tudor propagandists of Virgil, Hall, and ultimately Shakespeare. For instance, one cannot selectively quote the Bishop of St. David's Thomas Langton's letter to a friend that I never liked the conditions of any prince so well as this, God hath sent him to us all for the weal of us all, without recognising also the favours that were bestowed upon Langton by the king. Equally, the citizens of York may have recorded Richard's death in the famous words, King Richard, late mercifully reigning upon us, was pitifully slain and murdered to the great heaviness of this city, and two months later referred to him as the most famous prince of blessed memory. Yet that had not prevented the city's absence from the Battle of Bosworth, nor did it prevent gossip in a York tavern six years later, that Richard was a crookback. The archaeological discovery of Richard's body opens up an entirely new chapter in our study of this controversial king. It is without parallel, a truly exciting development in the study of Richard III, bringing us as close to the king as we possibly can be. Not only do the wounds displayed on the remains allow us to conduct further rigorous investigation into how Richard died, and what kind of weapons may have caused those wounds as the king faced his final moments in battle, as I'm sure that we're about to hear later today. I believe that we now have the perfect opportunity, not only to reignite popular interest in Richard, but to begin a new approach to studying Richard III, one which mirrors the exactitude and the scholarship with which these archaeological investigations have been conducted. 
And yet the discovery of Richard's skeleton, with the clear evidence of scoliosis and the possibility of uh, what's termed a gracile frame, throws up challenges for those who've argued that Richard's deformity was simply a scurrilous myth, propagated by Thomas More with those famous words, little of stature, ill-featured of limbed, crooked back, his left shoulder much higher than his right. While our discoveries may provide us with clearer answers about the wounds to Richard's skull that ended in his death, they also raise uncomfortable questions as to the validity of evidence previously written off. Do we now need to make a closer evaluation of Moore's evidence, recognizing that just as some passages of his work and the characters featured can be proven to have existed in the archival records, so too we need to take his own work with a bit less of a pinch of salt. Richard remains tantalizingly elusive to us. Unlike the monarchs of the 16th century, we do not have the luxury of the survival of the state papers, which allow for a full understanding of his personality. Only a handful of Richard's letters survive, though the work of Anne Sutton and Livia Visa Fuchs has proved that there is a great deal of material evidence out there, in particular Richard's books, including his Book of Hours that he carried with him to the battlefield at Bosworth, now in the Lambeth Palace Library, that can help cast light on the character of the king. We can cling to brief statements that reflect upon his personality, such as Richard's letters to his bishops, informing them that our principal intent and fervent desire is to see virtue and cleanness of living be advanced, increased and multiplied, and vices and all other things repugnant to virtue provoking the high indignation and fear and displeasure of God to be repressed and annulled. Or Dom Dominic Mancini's statement that the good reputation of his private life and public activities powerfully attracted the esteem of strangers. Just as Nicholas von Popelau's description of his visit to uh, Richard's court uh, with his audience the king, who reflected on his desire not to do battle with the Turks, remains an absolutely invaluable source. But we must not be content to rest solely upon these. We cannot divorce Richard the person from Richard the king. In particular, more needs to be done to understand Richard in terms of the concept of his medieval kingship. To what extent was Richard influenced, like any leader, by those men he surrounded himself with? I'm always struck, for instance, by the episode when in March 1485, after the death of his wife Queen Anne, and rumours swirled that the king was intending to marry his niece Elizabeth. Richard was forced to deny in public in a loud and distinct voice that such a thing had never once entered his mind. The Crowlin chronicler believed the opposite to be the case, revealing that the king's own counsellors, very well knew to the contrary, and in particular Sir Richard Ratcliffe and William Catesby, men whose opinions the king hardly ever dared to offer any opposition, had told Richard directly to his face that if he did not repudiate the rumours, the consequences, they warned, were that the opposition would not be offered to him merely by the warnings of the voice, for all the people of the north, in whom he placed the greatest reliance, would rise in rebellion against him and impute him to the death of the queen. We can try to understand the corporate nature of kingship and the influences that Richard may have fallen under. Perhaps we may be able to have a full understanding of the man himself. Now, Richard has become a figure that has transcended his own historical age. Each century has reflected the king in the mirror of its own values and preconceptions. For Horace Walpole, steeped in the philosophy of the Enlightenment, his historic doubts of uh, 1768 was the first serious challenge to the Tudor version of events, stating that all he meant to show is that though he may have been so execrable as we are told he was, we have little or no reason to suppose so. Walpole's scepticism and of the reliability of the historical events was a refreshing one at the time, yet it set the course for the historical studies of Richard that have reflected more on the intentions and beliefs of historians than on the man himself. For our own age, in the 21st century, the remarkable discovery of Richard's remains provides us with this fresh opportunity to reassess Richard the man and Richard the king. For myself, it is proof above all, that new discoveries are not only possible, but there are still new discoveries out there to be made. My previous book, um, A Study of the Death of Amy Robsart, unearthed uh, the original coroner's report of Amy's death. Previously assumed lost, nobody had ever thought to pour through documents in the National Archives to discover it. 
But there it was. Before her own tragic death, I'd been working with Leslie Boatwright on Polydor Virgil's original manuscript of the, Historia, of the Anglia Historia in the Vatican Library in Rome. Even now, today, historians remain oddly dependent upon a Tudor translation of an essential work that remains deeply flawed. Yet no one has thought it necessary to go back to the manuscript, which with its many additions and deletions, reveals Virgil's original thought process as much as it does the changes he made to the work when it was printed decades later. It's still out there in the Vatican to be transcribed and fully translated, and I hope that one day we can do so. This is just one example of the material that we need to do much more research upon that can enlighten us about Richard's reign. Still, entire series of documents in the National Archives, KB9s, E404s, and much more remain unpublished, untranscribed, and untranslated, waiting to reveal to us much more about Richard and his reign. Just as the archaeological investigations into the Battle of Bosworth would have been impossible without the dedicated team of amateur metal detectors who devoted many hours to achieve remarkable results. I believe that new finds of equal magnitude are yet to be found in the hidden depths of archives yet to be plumbed. If history is the study of the past that remains, let us not rest until all that remains is finally uncovered. If anything, the discovery of Richard's remains is a tale of how one woman's dedication and passion against all odds led to what we know today. And I would urge you all, whether you're an enthusiast, a dedicated Ricardian, this demonstrates that anything is possible. As a call to arms, get into the archives, get transcribing, and let us discover every possible scrap of information that will allow us to form the most complete portrait of Richard III that will lead to the truth. That is our mission for this century, with historical rigor and academic excellence to hand. These new discoveries do not merely herald a new chapter in Ricardian studies. They allow us to begin afresh, writing a new book with fresh enthusiasm for the scholarship that must remain first and foremost in our discussions of Richard. To paraphrase the Clare role, Richard liveth yet. Let this conference mark a renewed determination for us all to discover the truth about Richard III. Thank you.